my name is Yule and you're watching New Multicultural Community Hour. In this segment, we are talking about civic issues in Winnipeg, Manitoba. I would like to introduce our guest, Dr. Kafsir Ahmed. He is an executive director of Conflict and Resilience Research Institute Canada. CRRAC studies diverse dimensions of conflict affecting human security and livelihood. Hello, Dr. Kafsir Ahmed. How are you doing today? I'm doing very well. And how are you doing? I'm great. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us today. It's a pleasure and I'm very happy to be here today. Can you please introduce yourself and the projects you're running? Thank you once again uh, for inviting me. My name is Dr. Kausar Ahmed and I came to Canada to pursue my PhD in Peace and Conflict Studies in 2010. I graduated in 2017 from Peace and uh, conflict and justice department from Arthur V. Morrow Institute from University of Manitoba. Then I did my postdoc fellowship uh, at University of Winnipeg. It was funded by Social Science and Humanities Research Council of Canada. I do teach as an adjunct uh, in political science department of University of Winnipeg and also an adjunct in Natural Resource Institute in University of Manitoba. I co-founded Conflict and Resilience Research Institute Canada with Dr. Hilal Mahirdin uh, on December, uh, uh, in December 2017. Mm -hmm. And what was the impetus for starting Conflict uh, and Resilience Research Institute Canada? Very interesting question. Actually, uh, if you follow uh, some of the human displacement due to armed conflict, uh, you would uh, possibly know that Rohingyas uh, is an ethnocultural minority communities in Myanmar. So in 2017, uh, to be precise, August 2017, the largest exodus after Second World War till we had the Ukraine conflict. So that was the uh, very large uh, displacement of human uh, took place. And uh, they actually entered Bangladesh where I was born and raised and spent 40 years of my life. So when I saw that displacement uh, and I knew that it's going to be very complicated and a very long journey uh, about uh, this crisis which is unfolding in Bangladesh. So we decided that since we know the terrain, we have the knowledge and expertise, we wanted to contribute in conflict transformation and resolution. And that was my primary motivation when we first think of having a research think tank. And I would also like to add here by saying that mm, in our country, uh, it is uh, not very common to have a research organization particularly focusing on advocacy and uh, pure applied research. So uh, from that point, I think ours is a very unique organization which we started back in 17. Yeah, you've told that it's not common for our country to have an organization like this. Why do you think it is important? Uh, for two reasons, actually. Uh, first is uh, policymakers need some input from civil society. Uh, for example, uh, in the case of human displacement, and ours is a country, Canada is, is very proud to be involved uh, in support of humanitarian aids and, and many other uh, you know, uh, humanitarian assistances. So for that purpose, uh, you know, uh, the government and policymakers might not have adequate knowledge about the conflict itself and the dimensions and uh, most importantly how the money that has been allotted to be spent. So we fill that void. Uh, we come with the expertise of knowledge. We know the places, we know the people and their needs so we can advocate properly. And secondly, I would say that um, conflicts in far areas like Myanmar, Bangladesh, South South Asia are least discussed in North America mm -hmm. and especially, you know, because of the distance. So we uh, keep this agenda up and running by having, you know, webinars, seminars, dialogues, writing blogs, etc. So uh, I think for these two reasons, uh, our, our organization is quite unique. And what are your main groups are you working with? Who are your priorities? So uh, our priority of the projects, if you uh, might uh, ask in that way, um, so we, uh, we are working uh, very assiduously on Rohingya crisis resolution, supporting Rohingya refugees. And also since 2019, we are running a number of education projects for female adolescents in the camps because that is the most vulnerable group and they need uh, most of the support uh, in any given point in time. 
So that could be our number one priority. We have published two books on that. We have uh, ran over 50 webinars uh, on this issue. Second priority, uh, I would say that uh, local conflict issues and global conflict issues. For example, we are running a, a, a federally funded project. Uh, it was funded by Department of Heritage uh, in fighting disinformation war in Ukraine, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, through the Russian war. So we started b back in July, and this project is ongoing. It will be ending in March. Then we also uh, uh, actively participate in extremism and radicalization prevention in Manitoba. I'm the project lead uh, of a project uh, which is running for three years now, uh, funded by Public Safety Canada, and it is sponsored by University of Winnipeg. And finally, I would say we are also very much involved in transformative dialogue, uh, meaning that we bring people together in a single platform to discuss about conflict issues and how to resolve it. So th this is how we kind of connect the policymaker, the activists, mm -hmm. the students, and, and other uh, of, you know, stakeholders in the society. You have so many different programs and uh, researches. Which one do you think is the most successful one? It's or the most important one for our community? It's, it's difficult to, um, let's say, um, put uh, uh, grade on the programs, but uh, if you might say in terms of uh, beneficiaries, in terms of resources that we have mm -hmm. employed, I think uh, the uh, successful one would be our extremism and radicalization prevention in Manitoba. Uh, in terms of its reach, it's, it's quite uh, you know large project, uh, as I say, three years uh, long project, and we are uh, the target of this project is to educate. Uh, teachers in high school and middle school to understand the nature and dynamics of extremism, far right and far left and uh, you know Islamist and other types of extremism in our country, in our city. So I would say that would be the uh, most uh, uh, hopefully once done, most successful one. But I would also like to add that our project in educating Rohingya female children is also very, very important and uh, we have run two pilot projects and the second one is ongoing funded by Rotary International and we are educating nearly 500 uh, female adolescents in the camps. So this is really important and we always value the education of females in the camps. Do you think that public are educated enough about this stuff or we still have a lot to learn and uh, to get more knowledge? Well, interesting question in the sense that yes, um, we live in a world of public perception, no doubt in it, especially media plays a very big role. Uh, in terms of Rohingya crisis, I would uh, sadly note that uh, it is not much covered in our country, uh, other than at the top you know, federal level, uh, the, uh, our uh, Right Honorable Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, he is involved directly, he has appointed a personal envoy to, to look into this conflict. Other than this, I don't see much coverage in mainstream media about Rohingya crisis. And just so that you know, Canada is the only Western nation which has put forward nearly $600 million over the past six years, and also supporting a case in International Court of Justice uh, with regards to Rohingya genocide. And in our parliament, we have also recognized Rohingya issue as a genocide. So Canada is very much involved. but. In social media and in mainstream electronic and print media, I don't see much reflection on Rohingya crisis. Secondly, in terms of extremism and radicalization prevention, I, I, I would see, uh, say that uh, yes, it is covered quite a bit, uh, uh, but again, uh, this topic is very, uh, I would say, seasonal. If something happens, then people jump on this issue. They want to know this and that. For example, Freedom Convoy movement, mm -hmm. when it happened, e even in our city, people called me uh, you know, for interviews and I went and spoke in CBC, CTV, etc. But when it dies down, then people keep quiet and you know, uh, they just uh, go. But I think it's, it's, it's very much routine and normal in our life uh, because everything is issue specific and issue centric. Mm -hmm. And what steps do you think we should take to change the situation and uh, to make people more knowledgeable? And who is responsible for that? Who can make changes, like public or 
journalists or government or maybe organization like yours? Well, uh, I would say that uh, in a society like ours, uh, we are very privileged. Uh, that's what I really would like to start with. Uh, we are very privileged because we have all the resources here in Canada. We have electricity, we have running water, we have food in these stores, we have the affordability to buy stuffs, right? So this is a privilege which we have acquired just being Canadian. And if you look around and through your uh, channel, I would like to also say that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of people around uh, living in the globe, those who are not privileged as ours. They don't have food, they don't have running water, electricity, and et cetera. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, we all have responsibility to help and support uh, those marginalized, uh, those have nots, with whatever capacity we have. For example, from our organization, Conflict and Resilience Research Institute Canada, we have uh, organized 130 webinars, 130 webinars over the past two years. The aim of these uh, objectives of this webinar is nothing but reaching out to people with topics. So if you go to our uh, website, if you visit our uh, thematic areas, you will find 15 thematic areas that we touched, we covered, ranging from Rohingya crisis, extremism prevention to uh, you know, uh, climate action uh, and uh, nuclear, uh, uh, anti-nuclear youth uh, movement, uh, so and so forth. So uh, through these things, we are trying to reach out. But again, uh, as you understand that we, we live in a very fast pace, you know, information uh, eco chamber, if you might say so, and where things get uh, passed very quickly. So I would say that, uh, well, through your uh, today's interview, if uh, people are listening to us, I would request them to tune in uh, to our webinars. We regularly uh, broadcast uh, these webinars and for example today at 7 p.m. we have a very interesting high profile webinar uh, one senator from our uh, city Mary Lou McFadran and a member of parliament James Bezan uh, they are speaking about the anniversary of the Ukraine war because mm -hmm. we are running a project on Ukraine war and disinformation. If we compare the time five years ago when your organization just started and now do you feel that public became more uh, interesting and engaging in uh, the topic like this. And how many people are interested in uh, visiting and watching your webinars? Well, th that's, I, I think, a very important question. Let me give you some stats. Um, when we started back in 17, uh, well, we understand the power of social media. So we have had all these channels, you know, YouTube, Facebook, mm -hmm. Insta, uh, LinkedIn, etc. So uh, in 2018, when I curated the numbers, I do recall we had uh, something around 160 or 70 followers in YouTube and LinkedIn around 30, 40, Twitter, we have very active Twitter uh, you know, uh, post and uh, account, so um, around 50 and so on and so forth. But as of today, uh, let me share with you with a bit of uh, pride that we have 950. 25 followers in our YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. uh, you can just go and uh, see the stats. And in Twitter, we are being followed by 520 uh, groups and peoples. Then in LinkedIn, we have similar number. So I think uh, over the past five years, we have grown into the public space, the communication space, and uh, people are uh, talking to us. People do come and uh, join our webinar. And these webinars are totally free, right? I mean, we don't even sometimes pay honorarium to the guests. These mm -hmm. are all volunteer things. So people do feel that if they come to our webinar, participate in the transformative dialogue, they do contribute in resolving social and uh, global uh, you know, political and economic issues. And what tools do you think help you to engage more people and keep them interested? Well, it's a tough question. Um, the way we think, uh, uh, and keep our audience engaged uh, in two ways. First is we uh, pick issues uh, when we arrange a webinar uh, very carefully. We do extensive background research when we decide to arrange a webinar. For example, today's webinar 
is focused on the uh, uh, one year anniversary of the war itself. Mm -hmm. So for last six, seven days, we have planned, we have researched, we have prepared for this webinar. We have uh, reached out to the guests and all. So I think um, uh, this is one of the ways we, we work hard to make this interesting. And with regards to projects, I think uh, we also uh, subscribe to those projects which are very important uh, socially, politically, economically. For example, uh, rising extremism in our societies is, is a very uh, current issue. We have seen uh, the extreme right, uh, white supremacy and Islamophobia, anti-Semitism. Uh, these are all in the ups, you know, uh, uh, upward trend in our society. So we are working on that and people are automatically engaged because they also think that these are our social problems. Mm -hmm. You've told that you work uh, with uh, marginalized communities, with refugees, and you gave people a lot of knowledge about this. But uh, knowledge is good, but we need like more investment. Do you think is there enough investment uh, to help these marginalized communities in Manitoba? No. Uh, there is always a need, there is always a huge, huge need uh, because uh, when we say or let's say uh, identify marginalized communities, um, uh, there are a number of ways you can do that. So we academic, we view marginalization in many ways and uh, just to give you one uh, piece of uh, idea or concept is that we talk about structural violence. If the structure of the society, economically, politically, and in, uh, socially, culturally, if it is structured in a way that it automatically oppresses different groups of people, minorities, uh, then you know it is very difficult to change the structure itself. Mm -hmm. But just to be aware of the oppress oppressive structure is important, and here comes the uh, importance of the knowledge. And uh, I would say that uh, yes. Uh, more investment needed uh, in terms of helping uh, marginalized population in our city, in, a, in our province. For example, uh, we have a huge problem of homelessness as we all understand. And today, for example, it is uh, uh, utterly cold outside. And I'm sure we have not been able to meet all the housing needs of our people in our city. And we do have a uh, uh, lot of issues with regards to minorities. Uh, not being able to access uh, you know, uh, social services. We have taken refugees. We do take refugees each year from different conflict zones. When they come, they face a lot of barriers in terms of you know, uh, integrating into the society and they remain marginalized for many, many months or you know, in some cases years. So yes, we need a lot of investment, a lot of knowledge. Uh, well, you rightly say knowledge is one part, but without knowledge, how do you understand what you're going to do? So this is why these are interlinked. So we need action, money, fundings, but also we need an, uh, knowledge to understand the nature of the things that we are going to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, what are the policies in our community to address issued, issues faced by groups identified as marginalized? Policy-wise, uh, well, there are many organizations, so for example, Social Policy Council, SPC, and others, uh, we do study a lot of, uh, you know, marginalized communities, their needs and their uh, actual, uh, you know, what they want. Uh, but uh, uh, I, I do think that the policy knowledge generated uh, in terms of issues uh, must be transmitted to the policymakers because at the end of the day, you and I, we are not policymakers. We are living in a different spectrum. Uh, and a different uh, you know, uh, environment, but policymakers sitting in the big places, uh, for example, I'm, I'm talking about all three tiers of government, you know, municipal, city, and province, and of course, o overarching uh, the federal government. So they do make policies, right? And they decide how much money to be spent in what sectors. So from our side, civil society side, we analyze, we research issues, and we uh, provide knowledge to the policymakers, but policymakers at the end of the day uh, have to really prioritize because they know how much resources they have. And here comes the priority, right? Each government, each tiers of you know uh, government and uh, leadership, they do have their own priorities, right? Because they are elected each year, so uh, they have to also juggle this you know whole stuffs. So I would say uh, define synchronization. 
might not happen as you and I expect always. Uh, it's not an ideal situation, but we should try and strive towards an ideal situation where the recommendation meets the policymakers' priority. Mm -hmm. You have mentioned that we have Canada and Manitoba have a big number of homelessness people. Why homelessness is still a big issue in our country? I think um, uh, the uh, uh, as, as I was referring back to you, the structural issues that we have in our country, in our province, in our city, is one of the main causes that exacerbates homelessness. For example, uh, we are G7 nation, one of the richest uh, you know, club of nations that we have in the world. So technically, we don't like to talk about poverty, but poverty is there. And the way it impacts the ability of people uh, to have a roof on, the head, on their head is, is difficult to ascertain and understand. So there is a lack of understanding the actual need of people, those who do not have home. For many reasons, people become homeless. It is not exactly tied to the rise of mortgage rates or etc. Rather, it is tied to the livelihood, the way people perceive their need in a, uh, in terms of living in a in a in a place where they call it home, it varies, and and there is no the reason or root cause of homelessness. There are multiple reasons. These are economic, cultural and some bit a colonial legacy of oppression of our indigenous population. And these are, these are multiple factors that cause homelessness. And each city has their own cultural you know, differences. For example, mm -hmm. the homelessness in uh, Vancouver, which I practically witnessed many a times uh, passing through the you know, areas versus ours uh, is different because the factors which is operating in Vancouver and in Winnipeg are, are not same actually. Well, there are some common factors of course, but there are also varying factors that we must understand and you know, try to resolve so that homelessness becomes less and less uh, lesser each year. So is there any way to decrease the number of people who suffer from homelessness? Of course, um, there are examples uh, worldwide, uh, especially some of the uh, Scandinavian countries. If you go, you will not find uh, homeless people on the street. Uh, these are also very cold countries like mm -hmm. ours, right? Uh, Norway, Finland, and uh, you know. So as I said, in, in uh, Scandinavian countries. So uh, we we, sh we might look into their models. What did they do? Uh, but on the top of my head, uh, I would say that more investment in uh, uh, in housing. Uh, let's say economy, housing and cheap housing might be the first step to start because you need resources uh, first to get people inside, you know, uh, uh, you know, warm places and home. And secondly, I think uh, we should also uh, find out why uh, people become homeless at the first step, right? I mean, there are some psychological barriers, psychological needs. Uh, psychosocial needs. So, if we can find out uh, some of the things which is pertinent in our city, uh, I think that will uh, go a long way in resolving this crisis. And uh, what do we have to offer to meet the specific needs of homeless people and all the type of um, marginalized communities? So, um, when, as I said, uh, I'll go back to my initial comments that when we say marginalized, uh, we should be really um, you know, aware of which group of people we are talking about. Uh, are they uh, from indigenous communities or ethnic minorities, those who came here as refugees and uh, you know, settled down? So first we need to identify those things and the needs itself. For example, uh, in many cases uh, uh, our indigenous communities needs are different than that of you uh, know, refugee and uh, settling a settler community here because they come from different contexts. They have some skills and uh, different s skill sets, right, from f than that of our indigenous uh, members of the community. So we need to understand uh, those needs and those abilities of of different groups. And as I said, there is no homogeneous group of people that we can brand them, you know, uh, uh, marginalized and therefore they are subjected to homelessness. There is no homogeneity of this. There are diverse group of people, you know, uh, go back to this group of, you know, uh, or, or the category of homelessness. 
So, I think uh, uh, we should be able to do more research and convince the policy makers. Let me uh, end by saying that there is no dearth of research or mm -hmm. let us say uh, knowledge. What we lack is the application of that knowledge in real time and we need political willingness. We need the willingness to understand that this is a problem and sometimes I use the word crisis. I mean it because uh, it is a crisis. Uh, if it is minus 37 at night, uh, homeless people you know, person will die and one person dying in a country like ours is too much and this is what the priority our policy makers, uh, whoever is sitting in, in what strata uh, does not matter. Uh, they should understand that this is a crisis and let us label, label it as a crisis and then put our resources, our brains and our hearts and minds together to resolve this problem. Why is it important to work with marginalized communities? Look, we are all together. Mm -hmm. If somebody is marginalized and we are not, that does not absolve us from our duties and responsibilities as a good citizen. This society is composed of various types of people. Look at the multicultural, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, tapestry of, if I may use the word, uh, the the city, the place that we are talking about. Uh, if we even give example here, right? You come from a different background. I come from way different background, uh, culturally and you know, uh, uh, ethnic uh, uh, point of view. So we all are together. And if a marginalized community remains marginalized, there are two problems, because in many many cases, in especially in the Western world you will find uh, there are big cities even in London, UK, in uh, Minneapolis, uh, Chicago, uh, New York, all big cities, metropolitan cities, there are suburbs, uh, even in, in Paris, they call it Banilieus, mm -hmm. there are suburbs which are uh, often called ghettos. Mm -hmm. So we do not want any ghettos here mm -hmm. because if people are growing up, especially the young people growing up in ghettos, they are subjected to radicalization to violence, which you have seen in the case of Paris. Uh, you know, uh, I'm referring to Charlie Hebdo attack, and also uh, this whole marginalization creates a notion of injustice. And injustice, through injustice, if somebody is, you know, uh, uh, growing up within this uh, within an unjust system, definitely um, take it guaranteed that uh, they will become angry. So we and those who are not living with them or those who think that we are safe living in a gated communities, we none of us are safe because this anger will, will come out in some form or fashion. Remember the riots in London a couple of years ago. Why these riots in a city like London? But it happened, right? So we need to understand the bigger ramifications of uh, this hopelessness and which can you know, uh, brew within the marginalized communities. Mm, just to wrap up, what are your hopes for Manitoba's future in regard to improving access to services marginalized communities? Well, uh, 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 being an academic, uh, being a civil society actor, uh, I am optimistic. I have to be optimistic. There is no other option. So uh, let's start from there. And uh, of course, I do see changes uh, and I do see positive changes. And I'm very hopeful about the city. We have a new mayor, right? I mean, uh, very recently elected. And we have uh, all the uh, good hearted people in various, uh, you know, uh, government and uh, other uh, offices. And I just wanted to, uh, you know, convey uh, our, you know, civil society uh, side our message to them is that uh, if if you spend time uh, to understand, we are there to to give you knowledge, to give you research findings, uh, and and if you as policymakers take it seriously, if you allocate more resources, uh, this situation of homelessness and a lot of ways that people become marginalized, people perceive them as marginalized, can be rooted out. Winnipeg can be one of the model cities in North America 
uh, where uh, people live together, stay happy, and enjoy the multicultural uh, you know, society that we all aspire to be. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for thank, having me. Thank you for this great conversation. Our audience and I learned so much from you. Uh, thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, dear audience, uh, that is a unique privilege to talking to you. And please do follow Conflict and Resilience Research Institute Canada if you can. And we'll be very happy to see you uh, amongst our audience. Have a nice rest of the day. Sure. And Thank you, our audience, for joining us today. We hope you enjoy it. If you like the episode, please like, share, and subscribe to see our upcoming episodes.